Welcome to the Café Culture podcast, a season of discussions on culture, politics, philosophy and science. The following podcast was recorded on the 18th of March 2013. This week we hear from Patricia Woff and Angela Woods of Durham University, who explore pathologies of the postmodern. Well, thank you very much to, to Anthony and to the Newcastle Philosophical Society and to Cafe Culture and to all of you for coming out on such a grim evening. Um, and hello to anyone listening to this as a podcast later down the track. So as Anthony mentioned, um, Pat and I work quite closely together in, uh, at Durham University, particularly on a new project called Hearing the Voice. Um, and we both focus on one of the things we both focus on are kind of matters psychiatric and psychological from the perspective of, of literary and cultural theory. But I should, I should warn you in advance that Pat is one of the world's leading experts in postmodern literary theory. You have here with us tonight um, a, a true genius in the field, so that's why I've decided to go first, so that she can hoover up any kind of errors that I make um, in what she'll go on to say. So my... my talk is kind of divided into two sections. I want to set the scene a little bit by thinking about the question, what might we mean with the idea of pathologies of the postmodern? And what are some of the intellectual landmines that lie in wait for anyone who sets off to explore this territory? And then, as, as Anthony alluded to in the second section, I want to talk about how schizophrenia came to be seen as paradigmatically postmodern within a certain kind of, 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 kind of intellectual milieu. Pat's then going to go on to consider a whole range of other questions to do with post-postmodernism and to do with different kinds of pathology and ways of, of understanding the relationship between pathology, the self and culture. Um, but we're both here really with a very kind of informal set of ideas, very keen to hear your perspectives and the questions that you bring to what we think is a really fascinating topic. So, being a good kind of literary and cultural studies person, if you want to start thinking about the question pathology and postmodernism, you start with the Oxford English Dictionary. And it surprised me to learn that pathology only enters the dictionary in the sort of 16th century is, is when the meaning, um, when the idea of pathology as the study of disease and then mental disease comes into being. But it's not until the early 19th century that you get an idea that pathologies might relate to the social world, as the dictionary puts it, to an abnormality or malfunction in the moral, social, linguistic or other sphere. So this is a relatively new idea that we can have a pathology registering at a social level. If that's one very sketchy definition of one term, how then might we go on to define the postmodern? And obviously, we could be here until Christmas if we sought to give a comprehensive answer to that question. It's a notoriously contested, notoriously slippery term. But let's, let's work with a couple of shorthands. So post, the postmodern period, roughly speaking, could be said to be a cultural epoch, specifically in the West, from round about the late 1960s to round about the late 1990s or potentially into the present, depending on how you want to slice the temporal pie. Clearly, as the name denotes, it's something that comes after modernism or after, um, after modernity. But then there's an interesting question about the nature of that relationship. Is postmodernism the rejection of modernism? Is postmodernism the exacerbation of modernism, a kind of inflation or a popularisation of what might previously have been seen as, as a fairly elitist series of, of cultural moments and art forms? Or is there some other kind of permutation going on in the relationship between these two kind of movements or fields of force? In respect of the kind of stances that we associate with each, again, it's useful to mobilise for the sake of argument some really crude shorthands. So if we can sum up modernism in three words or less, it would have to be with Ezra Pound's dictum, make it new. There's something profoundly... Modernism is in some ways profoundly engaged with the idea of finding new languages, new modes of representation, new ways of uncovering new kinds of experiences. There's, a, there's an energy and a dynamism strongly associated with various modernist movements from futurism through to surrealism and everything that kind of comes in between. And similarly, if we wanted to juxtapose that stance with postmodernism, we might think of Jean-Francois Lyotard, the French philosopher's famous phrase, 
that postmodernism is, quote, an incredulity towards meta-narratives, that it's some kind of sceptical stance, some calling into question of the overarching explanatory frameworks that hitherto had been used to explain human civilization and progress. So it's a, it's a sceptical stance towards narratives of, of progress, such as, as Christianity or faith in science or Marxism. Again, I can't emphasise how broad brushstrokes I'm being here, but it's just to set up a field of force that hopefully we can interrogate in a little bit more depth. And the final piece of the puzzle then to add to this question of what is the postmodern is to think that the postmodern is fundamentally associated, again, in complex and interesting ways, with particular changes to the structure of society, changes that are economic, that are material, that relate to the ways we communicate with each other, that relate to the way that society is organised and the way in which we participate in it. So there's a kind of underlying, if we want to think of it in that way, kind of social basis social and economic and, and structural basis. So, if these are our two concepts, how do they come together in an idea of a pathology of the postmodern? Well, if we took a, a perspective from epidemiology or from the history of medicine, we'd probably want first to focus on new disorders or new so-called epidemics um, that happen within this cultural period. So we might think in this case of new diseases, like HIV AIDS, which perhaps kind of comes to define in some ways a whole lot of both public health and also cultural preoccupations um, in the devastation it wreaks both in the West and, and across the world as a whole. We might also think of diagnostic categories that are new to this period, even where they're naming things and experiences and, and ways of seeing the world that have a much older history. So post-traumatic stress disorder enters the diagnostic framework in the 1970s after the Vietnam War. Um, attention deficit hyperactive disorder is another thing we might think of as kind of postmodern in the sense that, that it comes into being as a clinical entity during this period. But I guess the perspective that Pat and I come from, without wanting to make too many assumptions about what we share in, in common in this respect, is that we're interested in, in postmodern pathology as thinking about this in terms of diseases or disorders and, and keeping both of those concepts very much in play, which aren't necessarily new in this period, but which somehow become more visible, more anxiety-inducing, more culturally significant in the late 20th century. And that this, this visibility, this, this, um, this kind of compulsion that they hold tells us something quite interesting about our preoccupations, particularly with ideas of selfhood, with what it means to be a self in the postmodern period. So there are examples of the kind of scholarship that we're talking about in, in, in this broad array. Um, there are two, I think, really interesting and important examples. One is, is the recent work of the French sociologist Aaron, Alan Ehrenberg, who writes about depression. Um, and anyone reading the papers will know that we're currently supposed to be in an epidemic of depression, and that, you, that word is used frequently to describe the kind of common prescription of, of SSRIs and, the, and the, the really significant increase in the number of people diagnosed with depression. But Ehrenberg's analysis emphasises that while depression has a very long cultural history and has undergone various permutations throughout, um, throughout kind of our, our intellectual heritage from melancholia and black bile through to, to ideas of, of kind of romantic creative genius in the romantic period, Ehrenberg sees a kind of postmodern depression as something fundamentally associated with weariness and with an inability to labour. And he links this to contemporary ideas of the self which emphasise that we are constantly required within consumer culture to perform the labour of self-definition, to constantly make choices, to constantly define who we are, endlessly to produce the self. So depression, he argues, has a particular resonance when as selves we are required endlessly to perform in particular ways. A different kind of work, but nonetheless one which is, is again, I think a kind of potentially high intellectual watermark of, of this kind of question of social pathology is the Canadian philosopher Ian Hacking's work on multiple personality disorder. Again, multiple personality disorder isn't a, an idea unique to the late 20th century by any means. But as Hacking shows, discourses around multiple personalities in the, the kind of so-called epidemic of MPD, and particularly in America in the 1980s and 90s, at once registered 
and potentially also generated new ways of understanding memory and of thinking about trauma, particularly with respect to childhood experiences. So the point in mentioning very briefly these two examples is to suggest that within this question of pathology and the postmodern, we're thinking about conditions which speak to wide, perhaps broad cultural anxieties, values and concerns, not just in an abstract philosophical sense, it's not just about playing a kind of conceptual game of bingo here, but it's also about understanding the role that institutions play, the role that the media plays, the role that psychiatric classification and diagnosis plays. So pathology the postmodern bring in this kind of conceptual layer as well as this institutional and infrastructural layer. So I would suggest. A final area that I'd like to touch on before we, we plough into the, to the substantive meat of talking about schizophrenia are the kind of critical concerns that are raised about this as a, as a broad area of inquiry. And the most, the most direct, perhaps the most immediately obvious areas of critique are that this entire discourse can be actually potentially very stigmatising and very disrespectful to those people who have lived experience of these pathologies and indeed those people who question whether even their experiences should be understood as pathological. So there is a strong view that describing something like anorexia or depression as a postmodern pathology inherently is inherently dismissive or diminishes people's experiences by implying that somehow they're merely cultural or that there's no underlying biological or biographical basis for these experiences or worse, that these experiences are things that are somehow within a person's will or control. Hopefully it would go without saying that neither Pat nor I would seek in, in having this conversation to cause anyone any offence. Um, and I think more than that, we're not necessarily convinced of the idea that acknowledging the historicity or the cultural resonance of suffering necessarily makes it any less real or suggests that it's any less real. We have, I think, a kind of commitment to actually wanting to unpack the kind of reductive binary thinking that would posit a hardcore biological condition on the one hand and something that was sort of merely socially constructed on the other. I think coming from an idea that our experiences of any kind of illness and suffering are always profoundly culturally shaped in important ways. But a second line of critique is perhaps the critique within cultural theory that asks why are we even using terms from medicine and psychiatry? Why are we using ideas of pathology to try and understand culture? And is there something really dodgy going on in this? So these kind of, these kind of crit criticisms within cultural theory question, for example, the fact that what we end up focusing on too much is, is the idea of the individual at the expense of a kind of broader inquiry into social relationships and the structure of society or that we're, we're looking all the time at discrete disorders and we're missing the connections and interrelationships between wider conversations about, say, mental health or about the nature of the self. And I guess a, a final area of critique, and, and in being final it's no less important, is that sometimes this talk of pathology can completely erase or subsume very important ideas of difference and very important distinct distinctions between different subjects. So where does gender, class, geography, sexuality feature in these ideas of the pathological? How are they being written and rewritten or potentially ignored within this kind of critical field? So those of you who are familiar with postmodern theory will, I hope, have appreciated uh, the distinctively postmodern move in my talk that is to start with a series of definitional quibbles, apologies, announcements of the impossibility of the project, its necessary provisionality, its partiality, its kind of insecurity. But I hope that you'll have forgiven that um, and we can all move on. Because I think if you're, if you're here tonight and if you're listening in down the way, then it's clearly a topic you think merits some kind of sustained investigation and I hope that you think is interesting. So, on to part two and thinking about schizophrenia. And the question that motivated my, what's been now for a number of years, inquiry into schizophrenia is this. It's how is it that psychiatry's most contested diagnostic category a category that is used to try and think about some of the most extreme changes to human experience, 
How did this category come to be seen by theorists of culture as quintessentially postmodern? Why, when there's no reported overall increase in the number of diagnoses of schizophrenia during this period, indeed, if anything, the, the kind of diagnostic patterns level out in, in certain ways, why, in that case, does it, did it come to have such a strong symbolic meaning? Well, the first answer to this question would, would have to be with the anti-psychiatry movement of the 1960s and 70s. Um, movement largely associated with the UK and, and France and Italy, other places in Europe, but that also reached America, particularly towards the, the mid-70s. And even though they disavowed the term, anti-psychiatrists like R.D. Lang put schizophrenia, I would argue, on the cultural map. They championed schizophrenia as a special form of meaningful, politically charged, and even enlightened experience. There's a, there's a debate about whether in anti-psychiatry due recognition in these accounts is given to the, the nature of people's suffering, but nonetheless, the figure of the schizophrenic, using that term advisedly as the term that they used, came to have this enormous kind of symbolic role within a particular kind of left-wing discourse. The cultural theorists who I think were influenced by anti-psychiatry had a, a similar interest in schizophrenia, but in a very different way. Instead of seeing this figure of the schizophrenic, again, inverted commas, as something distinctive or someone distinctive, as someone whose suffering really speaks to a particular set of circumstances or illuminates particular crises within the family or within social life, this is an idea that schizophrenia is actually a model for understanding the postmodern self per se, i.e. that schizophrenia somehow explains the experience we all have. Clearly, and this is the big neon lit caveat in then what comes after this point, this is a use of schizophrenia that's kind of deeply metaphorical. Um, and I should note for the record that it's not, discussing these ideas is not necessarily endorsing these ideas. And I'm not trying to make a claim about what schizophrenia is or isn't, particularly in a contemporary clinical context. But as I talk about in my in the book that Anthony mentioned, while we may find it odd or even offensive to think of, of a diagnostic category as being potentially a metaphor to explain postmodern culture, I think it's difficult to ignore the fact that the concept of schizophrenia had a really important role to play in defining postmodernism in a certain kind of strand of postmodern theory. It, it is a really significant concept, and it's significant because it's defining the self in, I think, mostly, but not always, negative terms. So the key account here, um, the one that, that like as Adi Lang from the, from the late 60s, the one that in cultural theory really puts schizophrenia on the map for the Anglophone world, is Frederick Jamison's famous essay, 1984, Postmodernism or the Cultural Logic of Late Capitalism, later published as a book and said to be the most cited article of the 1980s. I'm not sure if that's true, but it's a great statistic as far as humanities people go. We don't get a lot of statistics like that, so you hold on to them. 11,000 citations on Google Scholar and counting. So in sketching out the relationship between postmodernity or the structure of society and, and postmodernism or the kind of culture in, in thinking about postmodernism as the cultural logic of late capitalism, Jamison says the following. He says, social context is to be grasped as the situation the problem, the dilemma, the contradiction, the question, to which the work of art comes as an imaginary solution, resolution, or answer. So the situation of late capitalism, as he sees it, has the following kinds of characteristics. He identifies, and I'm quoting again, the new international division of labour, a vertiginous new dynamic in international banking and the stock exchanges, new forms of media interrelationship, very much including transportation systems, computers and automation. And these, this situation is answered then by postmodern culture, which in Jamison's account is marked by a particular depthlessness, an obsession with surfaces, a so-called waning of affect or a draining away of a kind of hermeneutic emotion, a loss of history and an aesthetic of fragmentation. One of Jamison's key ideas is that, that postmodernism transforms our experiences of time, of language, agency and identity. 
And this is where he borrows, in quite a creative way, a model of schizophrenia associated with the French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. Here, schizophrenia is conceptualized first and foremost as a breakdown in the temporal structure of language. Again, to quote Jamison, if we are unable to unify the past, present, and future of the sentence, then we are similarly unable to unify the past, present, and future of our own biographical experience or psychic life. With the breakdown of the signifying chain, this is his idea that schizophrenia is a breakdown in the links between words, in the kind of structures that keep the structure of a sentence together. So with the breakdown of the signifying chain, therefore, the schizophrenic, to use his term, is reduced to an experience of pure material signifiers, or in other words, of a series of pure and unrelated presence in time. So clearly, this is a notion of schizophrenia that seems to bear very little resemblance to any kind of clinical account. There's no talk of so-called hallucinations or delusions or thought disorder or negative symptoms. There's none of this kind of psychiatric meat or even first-person accounts as we would readily see them. Instead, Jamison's using this idea to try and understand a kind of breakdown in narrativity, a breakdown in identity that's registered at at least two levels. At an individual level, it's registered in a kind of collapse of identity or a collapse of selfhood, a dispersal of the self, a multiplicity of the self. And collectively, this means we have an inability to grasp history. We have an inability to anchor ourselves in time, which for Jamison as a kind of um, you know, strong Marxist is a, is a dire problem politically. If Jamison's ideas sound slightly strange, I can't overemphasize, I guess, their influence and the fact that there are a number of other accounts that we don't have time to go into that similarly explore this terrain where schizophrenia is connected to or used to interpret particular dysfunctions or disintegrations at the level of temporality, at the level of language and in an aesthetic sense. And there are, as I'm sure you'll agree, plenty of criticisms to be mounted against this as an analytic project. Plenty of blind spots, plenty of questions that we might want to ask. And I hope we can, in the discussion, actually get into some of this. But I want to conclude by posing the question of whether, if, as I've argued, schizophrenia was very important to cultural theory in sort of the 80s and 90s, is this a fascination that has endured? Is this something that, that, that contemporary cultural theorists would recognise as potentially being true of themselves or their colleagues? And I think the short answer is no. I think our fascination with schizophrenia in this sense, uh, in inverted commas, but I think that fascination is kind of waning, potentially for three reasons. The first is, I think, sort of Susan Sontag's argument about the dangers of using illness and metaphor has almost won the day. I think there's a broad sense that this is a somehow illegitimate and, and unhelpful avenue of inquiry in the first instance. I think the second reason is that part of why this fascination with schizophrenia arose was because there potentially was a perceived set of crises in the nature of, of the way we were theorising identity, language and time and agency, and that th there are other intellectual turns that were made that perhaps better resolved these crises or offered more positive ways out of them. So across the humanities and social sciences, you see a turn to affect or emotion, a renewed interest in the body, um, a sense of a, of, a, of a renewed interest in memory and trauma that are perhaps seen as, as better able to get us through periods of crisis into more interesting and complicated terrains. But potentially, and this is maybe a controversial point, perhaps our interest in, in schizophrenia goes on the wane because psychiatry is to an extent eclipsed by neuroscience that the humanities and cultural theory turn away from psychiatric and psychological accounts of the self into an enchantment in this age of neuromania with different ideas about the way in which the self might be constituted and therefore different registers of, of anxiety and problems and pathologies that it might indeed register. And I think this is maybe not where Pat will start, but hopefully some of the territory that she might mine in what she now goes on to say. <laughs> Cafe Culture North East is supported by Newcastle University, Peels and the British Science Association. We're also supported by Ginger's Cafe in Dun City, who host the events.